Tailing Dam Surveillance Program. Um, you know, the Tailing Surveillance Program is the foundation of an overall Tailing Storage Facility Safety Program. Tailing Storage Facilities are dynamic. They're continually evolving structures and construction on a regular and often near continuous basis through the mining long periods of time. You know, it's, um, today, Dr. Priscilla Nelson will be presenting on the future of tailings management. Uh, as a reminder, this is on Zoom. Uh, if you're on Zoom, please mute yourself. And if you have questions, type them into the chat. We'll either address them during or after the talk. Um, Dr. Priscilla Nelson came to the Colorado School of Mines in 2014 as professor and department head of mining engineering. She directs the Tailing Center certificate program. She has an international reputation in geological and rock engineering and has been involved in the underground construction industry for over 45 years. Dr. Nelson has published more than 180 technical and scientific publications, and she is a distinguished member of the American Society of Civil, Civil Engineers. Former president of the Geo, American, Geo Institute of ASCE, a lifetime member and first president and fellow of the American Rock Mechanics Association, and fellow of American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Nelson has received many honors and awards and is identified as one of the 100 Global Inspirational Women in Mining by Women in Mining slash UK. In 2018, she received the Outstanding Educator Award from the Underground Construction Association of SME. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Nelson. Thank you, thank you everybody. Um, let me tell you first that this is a, uh, presentation that's really based on um, uh, the work I did during my sabbatical, which I had last year, and I decided to take a deep dive into tailings while I was writing the chapter for the SME tailings handbook that has just come out. So parts of that chapter that I wrote, I'll, I'll discuss here, but not everything because there's too much in it. All right. So this is a picture of a tailings dam um, in a fairly arid country, not a lot of vegetation. The tailings dams are mostly built of local materials, often of the tailings themselves. Um, so the problem with tailings is that uh, we expect the minerals and metals annual demand to be 18 to 20 billion tons per year. And every 1 million tons of mine material generates at least 5 million tons of waste. Um, this 100 billion tons per year will increase because the mine grade is going down. And so the volume of tailings is increasing dramatically. Just as a, a, something might like stick into your head, about five cubic meters of tailings is produced every second globally from gold production, every second. So we, in fact, mining produces tailings. The metals are a byproduct. <laughs> so, the world has an estimated 35,000 active tailing storage facilities that we call TSFs. Um, most of them are at legacy sites. They are abandoned or at least they have not closed. We have a lot of open tailing storage facilities. Mining companies often uh, decide to put a tailings facility in care and perpetual maintenance instead of trying to close it and uh, turn the land back to the communities. Um, most TSFs are viewed as long-term liabilities that must be managed. And because of recent events um, and dam failures, uh, this has caused the whole industry to be in a fair amount of turmoil regarding tailings management. And uh, last year was the uh, Global Industry Standard on Tailings Management, which is the GISTM was produced and pretty much since then, all the mining companies are trying to figure out what they need to do in order to demonstrate conformance with that GISTM. So tailings, lower grade ores are generating even higher volumes of tailings and the negative social and environmental legacies jeopardize the mining industry's license to operate in places. 
So there's a uh, slide that shows a dry stack, as it's come to be called on the left, which is uh, filtered tailings that can be placed um, with compaction. We have a uh, typical tailings uh, pond with uh, spigoting uh, shown in the middle and the up close of the spigots shown on the right. So there's need for a whole new vision in the whole industry and the industry is responding because uh, this is uh, being driven by the UN's Sustainability Development Goals, SDGs, and a tremendous big word that's up new now, ESG, the Environmental, Social, and Governance Issues, um, which has really been driven by the UN and by organizations like uh, the Church of England's Pension Fund, PRI, which is an uh, investment group. And it's probable that the demands of responsible investment will be the driving force which will transform the mining industry. Um, and the transformation is one of new technologies, big data, and transparency, putting a lot of the data out so that everyone can see it. So despite improvements in safe design for TSFs over the past years, there have been reported failures almost every year for the past 30 years, some of them of significant consequence. Uh, the rate of failure of tailing stems is about one order of magnitude higher than the rate of failure of water retention embankment dams. And so we have failures. We don't know where all of them are. I didn't show a plot of the, of the world showing where the tailings are, tailings storage facilities are, because if you look at the data that's been published, you look at Russia, you look at China, there's nothing there because we don't know. We just don't know what's happening. So um, the tailings dam uh, problem shown on the left is in Australia. It's the Cadia Dam. On the right, it's Buadico that, uh, or Fajal that uh, failed in Brazil. It's a Valle Dam, failed in January of 2019. We have Mount Polly, uh, which really surprised the Canadians because the Canadians thought everything was fine. They were doing everything fine. <laughs> they were the best state of the art. And as a matter of fact, the, um, the uh, manual for uh, design of tailings <laughs> that is produced by the uh, Canadians has used worldwide. So this was a source of huge embarrassment when this dam failed. And there were tremendous environmental consequences here. Um, no one was killed, but very strong environmental consequences. The Brumadillo Dam had an estimated 300 um, people killed, but some of the bodies have not been found. And uh, the precursor to the Brumadillo failure was this, San Marco, which is also a valley dam, and uh, the dam broke and a huge wash of material went downstream and these flows actually reached uh, the Atlantic Ocean. So <coughs> big flows. Um, the world decided that we can't do this anymore. And we've also got Superfund and other problems with tailings, um, in particular, perhaps some of the uranium tailings out in our part of the world and really how to handle them from environmental consequences. People are moving waste from where it was placed during mining to somewhere else. And the process of moving has sometimes brought up surprises. We have uh, a tailing facility down in, in Arizona that's run by BHP, who no longer mines in, um, in the United States, but they're cleaning up their waste. They were picking up a tailing material and moving it to another place and in the middle of it, they found saturated fine silts and sands, and it would liquefy while they were trying to move it. This is, uh, was a very big surprise for PHP. Nobody thought that that was there. So we have a problem where we don't even know precisely what is there. And the laws of Brazil now require deconstruction of every high-risk dam, and that means declassification. It means you have to do something to make it be a not dam. And sometimes that's trying to take it down. And how do you take down a dam when you're not sure what's in it and you can run into the liquefiable materials that are inside the dam? So next five to 10 years are gonna be huge. Um, so we need to characterize for current tailings, characterize the material that is flowing from the ore body through the mining, through the process and the tailings. We need to understand that material. We need to understand um, its chemistry beyond the primary, 
So very often mining companies will really stay focused on the primary, which might be copper. Um, and they're not looking for other critical minerals. And I think you've all heard about critical minerals becoming important. We, in many cases, are not even sure where those minerals are or where the metals are in the tailings for the purpose of mining. So we need to really think about the physical changes, um, geometallurgical changes, which is where this stuff is relative to the minerals, to the geology, the chemical processes, and increasingly biological particularly microbial processes can become extremely important in how the tailings are weathering and aging and in how we might be able to get the critical minerals out. So big push right now on microbial activities. We need to minimize tailings volume and water use because water is a huge thing. Um, and that means remining, reprocessing, recycling. Um, we have to think that the acceptability of the social and environmental impacts may be a moving target. So 20 years ago, what was proposed might be okay. 20 years in the future, the people may say, no, that's not okay. So it's a moving target, which is one of the reasons why many of them have not been uh, closed. So we also need to think about how we can use tailings for something else rather than just disposing downstream use. So you think about the circular economy, with an unengaged mining industry by and large, the uh, mining industry is sort of outside the circular economy, producing raw materials that go in and, and uh, make all the products and, and, um, and recycling that goes on um, in the world. So how can we get mine, mining companies to actually think about um, what they can do downstream of their operations that generates what? Uh, generates value. But we had last year a, a, a competition that BHP set up for out of Chile. Um, and they are, their um, competition was, please come and take our tailings. You can do anything you want to with it. And the people who think up the best ideas will give them $10 million. But take the tailings, right? So the mining companies are not so interested in the downstream. So, but there is an opportunity in the value chain, the materials flow that goes downstream, and it can actually um, have mining enter the circular economy with value added products. And as those products develop, um, we'll start to understand even more about what, what certain types of tailings are good for and how to make the tailings more better for what we want to do as a downstream purpose. So this is a period of great discovery. Um, really thinking about everything from a whole life of mind perspective and integrating the geometallurgy all the way through the whole thing. So big drivers that I see for tailings management was minimized tailing volume, big data and sensing that we could do now that we couldn't do before, new technologies for processing or mining or any other purpose in mining uh, engineering. Bio-geo processes are becoming importantly understood. Water, water, water is huge in many areas where mining is there. And the sustainable development goals and ESG are huge and being paid attention to by lots of investors. So um, all of this has meant that in the last two years, um, tailings management is talked about in the boardrooms of major corporations. They talk about it and they know that they need to handle it. So opportunities are everywhere. And not just in the US, this is a slide that talks about an EU program called IDERHAMS, where they're talking sustainable mineral supply in the EU. What are they focusing on? Efficient water recycling, tailings valorization, that's the downstream reuse of the tailings for a new purpose and the environmental footprint. So the EU, it's an 8 million euro project going on. It's uh, really focused on getting out of the tailings conundrum. Okay, so the Global Industry Standards for Tailings Management, GISDM, places new demands um, on the industry. And the way the industry operates right now, fairly typically is um, the mining company operates to the end of this figure um, somebody outside is outsourced to provide a design for the tailings facility. And another firm, very often, 
is uh, retained to actually provide the engineering services during construction. And that firm um, appoints someone called an EOR, the engineer of record. And that engineer of record has the responsibility to uh, be certain to report that what is being built is what was designed. Tremendous responsibility there. Those people are usually outside of the mining company. They are hired by the mining company to come and do this. Um, this means that we need a whole lot more people. If everyone complies with the GISTM, we're gonna need at least an order of magnitude more engineers dealing with tailings than we have now. So very important area, um, a place to build a career. Right now, the civil industry, civil consulting industry provides most of those services. They're not internally to the mine, they're external consulting. And everybody there needs um, professional development, academic opportunities, which really don't exist anywhere in the United States right now or in the world. So we have a workforce of the future that demands that continued education. We have to have degree programs. We have to be able to recruit students into management in order to make the people pipeline work. Um, and that's why we formed the Tailing Center with uh, Colorado School of Mines, University of Arizona, and uh, uh, Colorado State University. And thus far, we've been running a lot of short courses. And this semester right now, I'm teaching the first graduate course that deals with tailings. And the second graduate course will be offered in the fall of this, of this year. Um, so we expect by next fall, we hope not this fall, fall of 2023, to have a master's program in place in tailings engineering and management. And we hope it involves all three universities. All of this has to be supported by the industry. So the industry has to really become more of a mentor to the academic programs and the continued professional development if we're going to get where we need to be. So opportunities along the materials flow. This is sort of the outline of the chapter. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I call tailings engineering, something about the downstream usage, the reusage, creating value added, and then a few comments about environmental opportunities that are happening right now. So let's talk about uh, tailings engineering. Advances being made in geometallurgy, tailings characterization, real-time tailings characterization. On the flow, you can figure out what's going on with the mineralogy. Never could do that before. So now we can track it and we can know where this stuff is. Um, and this causes uh, with time, temporal, and spatial distribution of tailings because not all tailings are the same. Mining companies mine here for a while, and then they mine there, and they mine there. The character of the tailings changes over time, and we need to keep track of that better so we understand exactly what we're building. Um, and such a real-time characterization may also support waste stream segregation or partitioning. So if we find out that we have a downstream use for something upstream, it may be economically advantageous to do that separation and uh, continue for the downstream use. Um, one of the biggest problems with, uh, with tailings is water, because what we have behind the tailings dam is effectively soup, right? It's a very high water content material, and it takes forever to consolidate and gain strength. So ways of uh, consolidating, accelerating the consolidation. Um, I put a picture up there of what I call, I call that um, a spaghetti. And if we can make these little tubes that actually can absorb the water, we'll spit them out with the tailings and they will drive the rapid consolidation. Because you see, if we can rapidly consolidate the tailings and get the water out, the tailings gain strength. And then if the dam fails, the tailings don't go anywhere. They just sit there. So we need to control the water. There's other ways of stabilizing, including compaction, particularly of filter tailings, Experiments on all of these things are being tried all around the world. Almost, it's very difficult to find out what different companies are doing. There's no central reporting location. So we need to gather all of those experiments so that we can understand what worked and what didn't work. Um, and IoT and sensors, people are talking about using nano sensors or moats that you could put in the tailings flow and that would actually tell you what's going on 
for example, with the rheology of the flow in the pipeline, what's happening there, and could also tell you what's going on when you try to do a thickening or trying to do a, um, a, a filter tailings production. So you make the tailings smarter, <clears throat> so they tell you what they're doing. Um, and increased sensors, both the physical ones that we put in the ground or on the ground, but also increasing use of satellites. Um, it, it's huge and multispectral so that you can actually learn some things about the tailings from the multispectral signature that you can see from an airplane or from a satellite platform. Um, digital tailings management, this opportunity to actually keep track of where everything is in the TSF as you place it. And the idea of making a digital twin of the TSF during construction. The TSF is, I mean, these things are built not all at once, right? A water dam is built at one time, right? You build the water dam, retain water, done. Tailings dam, you start with a low dam, add to it, add to it, add to it. So all during the operation, it could be 30, 40, 50 years, that tailings dam is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? As a matter of fact, the tallest water retention dam that we have, an embankment dam, is on the order of 100 meters in maximum height. We have tailings dams that are 300 meters high and expected to go up more, up towards a kilometer in height. This is a totally different stress situation. And we have to think about what that's going to happen. So we need to know where the material is in the tailings facility so that we can actually engineer it ideally by putting the right stuff where it needs to be. We also have to maximize water recovery. And energy is a big thing in the mining industry. So we have to figure out how to minimize uh, energy use. Uh, mm -hmm. We have out no, 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 up for these guys, I don't think. To understand what the only one was Miguel. Telling us and to decide. And there's a bunch of folders here for like people out at Garrett. Uh, models out there of tailing stands that have 19 supposedly independent geotechnical parameters that have yeah. nobody knows what those 19 parameters are. <laughs> so it is a problem. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the plan right now. There's the four. So that people there's will. four, and then there's two more that I'm going to train tomorrow. Um, we action and sharing. And the GIS. I, I dumped. So we also have direct use of tailings materials uh, for the other for well for Miguel, Benjamin, Victor, and Leroy. Bauxite. I dumped. I printed out the stuff I have for them, document wise, for NGM as a whole. Uh, punching holes in that application right now. Valet. I better actually do some for Kendall and Justin, I suppose. Physically separating out the sand sizes that are still there. And they are finding that sand sizes are pretty good quartz, and they can sell it for construction sand. And the world is running out of sand, in case you didn't know. Yep. I find good supplies of sand. So being able to get the sand out of tailings, yeah. uh, steady. It, it can't be shipped forever, but Vale can take it well, on. I'll, I'll, I'll look at the end. Transportation yeah. costs. Yeah. I didn't notice anything before. Sure, sure. 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 Sure because everything that comes out of the mill, we will have a use for. That's their goal. And they're building a huge industrial center, um, expect to be a full production 2027. They told me that that has slipped a little bit, but that's what happens. And they're gonna recycle tailings. Um, they're gonna produce hydrogen fertilizer, rare earths, gypsum and fluorine products, and anything else that they can find. And I've been talking with them, the Tailing Center people have been talking with them about ideas of what they might be able to do. El Teniente copper tailings are being reprocessed by another company. Because sometimes older tailings um, might have more copper in them 
than uh, the ones being produced now because of processing efficiencies. So you can remine. Beside Nickel Australia is hydraulically reprocessing old tailings. And we have a number of people that are looking for bio leach and bio microbial processing in situ or in heat leach kind of facilities. Lots of experiments going on, trying to figure out exactly which ones are gonna work for and which ones scale up to the scale that we need for the volume of tailings. We're gonna to have to wait and see. Um, downstream opportunities also include these new manufactured materials. Um, in fact, the quantity of tailings is so large that we're, we can't do anything that makes us move them very far from where they are, cost too much, unless you can do hydraulic hydro. That's about it. So what we want to do is figure out how do we raise the value of what we can make with the tailings locally so that we can sell them for more product, more price, and then ship them. In the future, we're starting to see this happen. Um, I did a survey and just hit the literature. The number of peer-reviewed publications relating to tailings reuse and production materials. And you see from 2010, there was one paper that was produced. And 2020, there was 130 papers that were produced. This is just ramping up. Everybody in the literature is trying out something. But very often what they're doing is they're taking one batch of tailings, doing an experiment, writing a paper, and that's it. So putting the whole thing together so that you can understand how we should systematically deal with tailings is something for the not so far future, I think, but there's a lot of experiments being done. But if you look at who wrote those papers, these are um, where the authors were from in uh, different countries. Oh, about half of the papers were authored by people from Asia, predominantly China and India. Um, Europe, wrote a whole lot, there's a lot of EU money for this. So if you get money, people go and work on it. And that's what's happening there. North America, we're 13% authorship and 9.1% of that is Canadian. So in the US, we're not major players in this yet, but we can be. And we think about what they're doing with the tailings. These are the kinds of applications. And you know that mortar, um, backfill, concrete, cement, bricks, aggregates, these are massive, heavy things that don't, you can't sell them for a lot of money. So we can look at ceramics, glass, geopolymers, and I'll talk a little bit more about those because we can raise the value and potentially actually have a business involved with this that actually makes money. And, and I want to enunciate that there's a lot of tailings coming from different kinds of operations and they're all being investigated. It's not just copper tailings, all of these kinds of tailings and slags are the subjects of the papers that people wrote, right? Okay, so direct use of tailings material. Oh, I already said that. Okay, I already said that too, at least this morning. Okay, new manufactured materials. Focus is on substitute ingredients for concrete. And we're interested in this because concrete is made of what? What's one thing in concrete? Sand. 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 Water. Cement. cement. Right. And when we make cement, we produce CO2. Right. So the cement industry and the construction industry is a significant producer of CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, the annual use rate of concrete is expected to rise to more than 15 tons per person per year by 2050. Right now, it's at about five tons per person per year. That's concrete, and almost none of it is recycled. So a lot of sand is tied up in this old concrete, and we can't figure out how to undo the concrete effectively. So if you want to make a whole lot of money, figure out how to undo the concrete. Um, but it's this combined drive of trying to use tailing somehow in this process, but also reduce the CO2. One thing is alkali activation technology that produces something sometimes called geopolymer. The idea of taking mine tailings, mixing them with some hydroxide, maybe sodium hydroxide or some other material like that, and water. And what happens is the, uh, the uh, sodium hydroxide or the hydroxide and the water cause a solution, start of a solution of the sands and the aggregates. And 
Then during curing, they, so the dissolution recrystallizes. So you're not putting cement in, you're actually causing the material to form its own cement. And that's the idea. But it's only really investigated to make construction materials. There have been people thinking about alkali activation enhancements. How can you be more effective and produce even higher strength materials? Um, grinding, physical, mechanical, and mechanochemical um, grinding, you could do that. And you can actually, these uh, materials are wet. You can actually start to develop that binder gel in the grinder. Um, people have studied chemical activation by blending and thermal activation can also be used. So these things are all trying. There's experiments all over trying to figure out how to do this. There's a fellow over in France who actually uh, formed something called the Geopolymer Institute. And he's a, uh, a chemical engineer. He figured out a way of um, controlling the kinds of tailings that you use, the kind of materials that you use, um, by using metakaolin, some of you might know what metakaolin, it's uh, you, you kill kaolin and you end up with metakaolin. Um, but you can make a stoichiometric compound with silicates that is like a polymer, a real polymer. So chemically, we have chemical attack, dissolution, and then gel formation, and then crystallization. They have a stoichiometric structure, which means it's definable. It's not like one batch is going to be something different from another batch, um, which is very interesting. And on the nanoparticulate level, you can see on the left the just uh, the, the starting material, and you start seeing this gel binder that's crystallizing on the other side. So this is a different animal than just trying to make concrete uh, substitutes. And the characteristics of these kinds of materials that have been reached so far is pretty easy to get up to around 100 megapascals compressive strength. That's pretty high for concrete. Right. Um, so we're going there. Um, we have new manufactured materials coming in. There's a lot of nanomaterials, nanosilicates. When you mix them in with tailings, strange things can happen. We have tailings have so much surface area, right? So much surface area, you've ground it all up. And then you put nano silica in there and mix it up, you will get reactions that are generally not particularly fast in most cases, but they speed up when you do things like this. Um, and so we can do this. They're making artificial zeolites out of some of this material, and then glass fibers, which I want to talk about. So, fiberglass manufacturers started in the early part of the last century, 1900s. And um, they're made from silica sand. You melt it and then cool it quickly into fibers. And that's how you make fiberglass. <clears throat> and then you can weave the fiberglass. You can do whatever you want to with it. It's pretty hot and bothered in the early, say, 1910s, 1920s, a lot of patents. <clears throat> At about the same time, a patent came into being. It was actually a US patent about instead of trying to melt quartz, let's melt basalt rock. And that's not so weird because if you've ever been to Iceland or Hawaii or anywhere else where there's a lot of basalt in the world, right? And it erupts. And when it erupts, it produces Pele's hair, which is like a glass fiber that's produced naturally by exploding um, the basalt magma up into the atmosphere. So it seemed logical that you couldn't melt basalt and do that yourself. Um, and that's what has happened. Um, the primary people moving this forward have been the Ukrainians. There is a, a basalt manufacturer in Ukraine and the Russians, but nobody knew very much about it until the Soviet Union fell. So we get to the 1990s, we start seeing them trying to market it worldwide, their basalt fiber. And um, you can go on eBay now and get basalt fiber. And what does it look like? This is basalt fiber. Just very fine glasses. And it's so fine, it's not, it's not devitrified at all. It's very strong. And anybody who's taken fractional mechanics, you know that if you've got a very thin piece that doesn't devitrify, glass can be extremely strong. This stuff's stronger than most steels. You can weave it and make fabrics. And this is something that 
the U.S. military was interested in, where they could um, take this like a Kevlar material that you use to stop bullets, because it is ballistic, and put it underneath the vehicles that were getting killed by the, the road bombs, right? But they had a problem. They didn't, couldn't have the consistent quality because you've got, even though the salt is fairly consistent in its chemistry and mineralogy, it all comes from one magma flow. It's not perfectly. And they were not controlling it well enough so that the US military decided that they didn't want to pursue this area of research. But it's here and it's being used by, you can make rock wool. If you have a car, a vehicle that has a very hot piece of operating equipment in it, it probably has basalt around it because it is extremely good at conducting heat. You can chop this fiber up and end up with this bag of chop fiber and add this instead of steel um, into steel wires into shotcrete. Now, what is the major deterioration of shotcrete is caused by when you put steel fibers in it, what happens? Yeah, this stuff doesn't corrode and it's stronger than the steel. Right, so a mining company out, out in uh, in Nevada called me up and said, "We have too much corrosion going on. Our bolts are dying." And I said, "Use basalt rebar." He said, "What are you talking about? This is basalt rebar. It's made out of this as a composite manufacturer. Right? It's got epoxy resin in it. But anybody ever felt how heavy is that? Pretty light. Pretty light. This is a rebar. Compare that to steel." <laughs> I mean, it, it's only about 2.5 specific gravity. So that's pretty neat, huh? Yeah. So can we make, if we can melt basalt, we can melt tailings. Now we have to figure out the thermodynamics of what is a good mix. What is the thermal, the thermodynamic, the thermokinetic situation where what temperature, um, what mix do we have to put fluxes in it? It's like making glass. If we can figure that out, we can make glass from tailings. And then we can make all sorts of high value products. So now we can move on to environmental opportunities. I think what we need to do and what work is going on, but we need to understand more about what happens with sulfitic tailings over time. Because the sulfide will become oxidized and you will end up producing acid mine range. And uh, we don't want that. So people are doing work on trying to see if, if there's microbial activity that might be able to do something about this. A um, lot of work going on in particular at the University of Queensland. So the evolution of GSF seepage is also very interesting because nobody's out there monitoring it full time. So the idea of trying to get a full time understanding of what's happening. And uh, we had a project here with Masami um, where a student was trying to use geothermal springs to keep the water warm enough so that it could be microbially attacked. But in Colorado, it's got to be about the temperature. Um, so if some mines don't start out producing acid mine drainage, and everyone thinks it's fine. And then 15 years after water has been moving through, any buffering in the material is gone, and now you get acid mine drainage. So we don't understand what happens over time. We still have to do a lot of work. But another subject I want to bring up is carbon sequestration. Everybody's talking about carbon capture, utilization, and storage, right? CCUS, we don't like CO2, we want to get it out and put it somewhere. And so we can try geologic sequestration where we put it down at depth where things are hotter, pressures are higher, Hopefully it will go super critical and will react with whatever the material is and form new kinds of minerals. And so that's been investigated. No experiments to date that are convincing that it's possible to do. Um, ocean carbon sequestration can also be done. Direct use, you can capture the CO2 and use it for CO2 in industrial processes. But the thing that gets me interested is mineral carbon sequestration. If you can figure out how to get the CO2 to become a carbonate mineral, then you fix the CO2, right? And it's not going to leave again because it's now a stable mineral. So I want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, 
So here we have your extraction. You do all that grinding, you have a huge surface area and you wanna mix the CO2 with it. So experiments are being done right now to try to figure out how to inject CO2 into tailings and then to till them so that you can keep them rotating. And then you're trying to make effectively the magnesium silicate become a magnesium carbonate. That's the goal here. So you're having carbonate precipitations. And I think it could be accelerated by microbial enhanced weathering. So people are just starting to pay attention to that. So they're looking right now at ultramafic minerals. These are minerals that are um, typical of very, very deep in the earth's crust and down in the mantle. Right? So they're not at all happy at standard temperature pressure up at the ground surface. And they weather very quickly. Um, out in California and in mountain chains, some of these ultramafic rocks become ser serpentinized, um, which means that they weather effectively and they become a hydrated form. And that's what we're after, is that serpentinite. But that will work. Everything that's been done so far is working on the ultramafics. Most mine tailings are not ultramafics. The ultramafic is where you mine nickel up in Canada. Those are ultramafic rocks. Right? But down here with, with porphyries, they're not ultramafic. So I've been talking to people trying to figure out if we can develop microbes that are much better at, say, intermediate or granitic composition um, tailings in enhancing the weathering, because the same thing will happen there. So stuff is happening. Um, FPS Nickel is working with researchers from UBC. Um, they have done some experiments. I say they're pilot scale, not full scale, um, about using their tailings to uh, take up CO2. And Tesla has come and told them if they can make green nickel, they will buy all of it. Right? They want green nickel. Giga Metals is doing similar projects on carbon sequestration. Again, that's up in Canada. Um, they're finding as a byproduct, the carbonation um, reduces the dust problems in mining and also uh, strengthens the tailings because you're putting a cement in them. So lots of ideas, but nothing that is looked like it could scale up to the level of, of CO2 sequestration that's needed. But tomorrow at uh, three, Friday at three o'clock, Peter Kellman is coming here from uh, Columbia University the Doherty um, Geological Observatory, and he'll be giving a talk and he's going to be talking about um, his take on sequestration. But Giga Metals, what it does is it takes the material and it produces nickel, and what they're going to do is take the tailings, put them in a tailings facility, and they're going to inject CO2 to form in situ carbonates. Theoretically, you could do this with other materials as well not just the metal mining. So you can do it with slags, you can do it with coal ash um, and other kinds of waste products, including phosphogypsum, which is a major problem because we think we have a lot of tailings. Phosphogypsum is a uh, byproduct of production of fertilizer. And there are mounds of phosphogypsum accumulating in various countries, huge mounds, nobody knows what to do with them. So overall, we have uh, TSFs, we have to risk monitor, we have to assess, we have to think about what to do with the tailings to try to bring value. And big for the future, I think, is this uh, we have existing unused or legacy facilities that we don't know very much about. Um, we have to address those. And we have to address climate change in some rational way. Because right now, no one knows how to do that. So very interesting time. We have work to do, lots of ideas out there, and I think the next 10 years dealing with tailings are going to be extremely exciting. Thank you. So, I know I talk fast. I'm a fire hydrant, I just spew out stuff. But if anyone has any questions, or in the future, if anyone wants to just have a discussion about any of this stuff. I'm game. Um, do we have any questions in the room? Obviously, you can handle your own question session. Um, Anybody we should have be a question or a comment? 
Go ahead. Yeah, I have one question. You said something really concerning that the tailing stands we have right now are different than the tailing stands declaring the mine design. Is that what you said? What, what I said is that when the designer designed a tailing stand, they made certain assumptions about what was going to be done. Very often, what was going to be done needs to be verified, validated by the engineer of record. So you may find the, the, the fineness of the tailings may change over time, or the bore water pressures in the dam may be too high, higher than what they assume. Mm -hmm. Right? Why? So tailings dams are not perfect. And you can design something on paper, and you go out into the field, and they're almost never the way it was designed. So we have a lot of instrumentation. We build models and validate, refine the models and continue um, instrumentation so that we build increasing confidence in what the computational model is telling us because it responds the same way that our GAN does. And the legal uh, implications behind the failure of this uh, the legal implications are redirected to the people who signed the document certifying that it yes. was a safe one or yeah. goes to the yes. operation. Yeah. It's, a, it's an engineering kind of liability, right? Okay. Okay. So after the Brumadillo um, failure, there was a, a, an international um, committee set up to scour all the information and come out with their conclusions as to what happened. And it was all. You can see the YouTube of, uh, video of that press conference where they, they rolled out what happened there. Um, and then about eight months later, um, the Brazilian government had contracted with a research organization over in Spain. They did their own analysis and have a completely different mode of therapy. So this is, this is complicated. It's not easy and it's not going to be easily solved. And we have to have compassion for ourselves as engineers and then, right? But it's not a science yet. Does that address what you wanted to know? Yeah, I also wanted to confirm because in the Brumadinho uh, failure, the ones who were prosecuted were the operator, but not the people who signed the document. In, in that case, because of the civil, well, nothing's all done. Yet. Yeah, it's still um, it's, in the book. <laughs> but the people who were immediately arrested were the, um, the yeah, the executives. And one of the things that the GISDM says as a document is that, and, and a lot of people didn't have this, every TSF, um, every company has to have what they call an accountable executive. Someone who meets at the boardroom and is accountable for everything that's going on with the tailings. And that was an implication. Steve. Yeah, so it's really interesting all the different ideas that you threw out there. And, and I'm thinking that society's <laughs> demand for minerals is going to get larger, so that the problem we have is going to get larger, right? Not smaller. And that the primary focus should be on stabilization, environmental mitigation, that kind of stuff. But the other things that you threw out in terms of, you know, downstream uses and you know, some of these other opportunities, which ones of those do you think have the most promise to have a material impact yeah. as opposed to a great idea, but it's not big enough to make a difference? So what effectively we're thinking about is what is the killer act? Right. Right. And I think it's going to change over time. I think, um, and, and it has to, in part to do with energy. I think that we're going to be able to melt tailings and produce all sorts of good things, but the energy to melt is going to be um, a problem. But NASA and the people who are working up on the lunar and, and Marsh, Martian uh, uh, regolith, the soils that are up there, they are using developing concentrated solar to melt the material. So if we think about concentrating solar, how much energy can we produce? And we can do it remotely because it's just wherever there is sun. And so I think we can start doing that. And if we produce stuff like this, this is this this is a high enough value that we can we can do it. In the short term, though, I think what we're going to do is as we start looking at the tailings that we have and that we are producing, there's going to be remining, um, maybe secondary recovery as like uh, like uh, Rio Tinto is doing out at Kennecott. Um, 
and people are going to think about greater efficiencies for extraction. And sand is going to be something that I think is a marketable commodity. So, so I'm, I'm struck by the melting piece because it makes it worse if we try to use line power, right? I mean, from traditional energy sources for that. Yeah, we don't want to do but you can co-locate solar, uh, you know, on mine waste and, and maybe even tailings. You bet. You bet. All that the you know, Chilean and and, um, and Peruvian, there's a lot of sun out there. <laughs> and the idea of trying to figure out how to do that. The good thing about that is that it also leaves a renewable energy supply for the people that are in, in impact in the area. So you can do that, produce products. You could actually, ideally, build a manufacturing plant to use the fiber that you're making to create even higher value products that can be transported. So I don't want to give up on that. I mean, I'm so convinced that something's possible. But yeah, and, and then I think um, we're going to do, there's going to be a lot of genomics work. We're going to be making, making our own bugs that can be very specific to extract very specific critical minerals. And I, I talked to the biologists, I said, most, most engineers I know, they try to understand everything, first of all, by physics. That doesn't work, they'll go to chemistry. And the last one they go to is biology. <laughs> and we find out that, so there's a big project right now up in Canada um, that's being run by tech where they are simply taking samples and trying to figure out um, what bugs are there. What are the bugs that are there? There's a company called Semvita that was over at the SME meeting and they have these sample kits that they were trying to hand out to everybody who wanted one where you could take a sample of your tailings and send it to Semvita and they will analyze it and tell you what the bugs are. And I've been talking with Semvita about setting up a project where we just do exactly that um, and work with people who we hope, companies that we hope will be members of the tailing center and do this as a service, start building a big library of bugs and try to figure out which kind of bugs work best for what kind of applications. So that's happening. <clears throat> so is making better tailing stands and being able to store more tailings also a very good next five-year plan as far as if you're making new materials yeah is well, that the first application but for the downstream right steve is asking about the downstream uses mm -hmm. i think that um what's really important here is to get our hands around the water because the problem with the tailings dams is the water that's in the tailings so to me getting rid of the water and trying to get uh, there's some experiments going on right now about using electrokinetics to actually um, drive water out of the tailings. Because right now, the tailings, they're very fine. It's like a, it's like a milkshake. And, and it takes forever for settling to happen. Um, but if we could, instead of using gravity to drive the settling, we put in an electric field and drive it with uh, electric radiant from cathode and cathode move the material, we might actually be able to extract some minerals out of the water if we do it that way. But we're going to be able to be much more effective about removing water. And I think the key right now in the short term is having a way to get the water out of the tailings so they're stronger, so that even if the dam fails, nothing goes anywhere. Does it all come down to energy then? Because this electric field idea needs energy for melting, it needs energy. Yeah, it's not a super energy intensive process. And it's been demonstrated up in Canada in the, um, the, the tar sands. They have, they have run some pilot scale projects and actually demonstrate that you get the water out of that stuff. Um, but there's so much extra you know, heavy carbon stuff left in that. It's a the tar sands are not, uh, not crushed, the natural sands, right? So they that, do that some, it they do some things, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, but this is a, this is a, this is a field where, I mean, just for the last 18 months, all I've been doing is thinking tailings. 
right? It's, it's a, a very fun subject and it's going to be vibrant for the next at least 10 years. Lots of things are going to be happening. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, we'll end there. I do want to remind everyone that the video of this um, was recorded and will be posted on the department's website. Um, thank you all for attending. Um, students, we're still looking for seminar leaders for next year. Please come talk to me if you're interested. Professors, if you have students who might only be a little interested, maybe we can make them very interested. Um, the faculty will help. You're not just out there by yourself. The faculty will help. And hopefully you've seen that in this case and that throughout the semester, faculty do come through. And we have a good number of uh, speakers lined up for next semester. Also, if you know speakers, anyone, faculty or students, please suggest them. Um, we're starting to schedule for next semester since I believe the date has been set, day of the week for seminar. Yeah. It's going to be Thursday in the fall. 5 p.m. Um, with that, I want to thank you all. And for people present, we have pizza. Sorry, I was a little bit late. Uh, Priscilla, thanks again for speaking. Yeah. Um, obviously, always a great talk. So thank you. And the pizza. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good story. Also, oh, very much so. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yep